with my privilege to introduce the uh, speaker this morning, Brother Dub Mallory. He's going to speak to us on the influences of college on scriptural unity, and certainly the uh, colleges have been a, had an insidious impact on Christian unity, as of course the Bible defines uh, Christian unity. He, uh, his uh, file here, says the late brother Roy Henson uh, baptized uh, him in 1955 in his hometown of Idabel, Oklahoma. And he encouraged Dub to preach a few weeks later, March 1955. So by my estimation, that's 53 years he's been preaching. Is that right? And he's only 59. <laughs> so he started at a relatively young age. He attended pre uh, Hardeman College, now at the university. And he was in the United States Coast Guard, uh, continued his education at Harding College, now University. Just keep in mind, when it was college, it was a good institution. When it became a university, something happened. Uh, he's married to the Charlotte uh, Abney, married in 1960, again at a relatively young age. And they both grew up in Idabel. Um, he began his first full-time work as gospel preacher in, in Clayton, Oklahoma, and he's preached a number of places since then, Oklahoma, Texas, Arkansas, Nebraska, Colorado, and he's written for a number of papers, including Contending for the Faith, and uh, he has two grown sons, uh, son Paul and daughter-in-law Diane live in Austin, and uh, yeah, they have another son, foster son Lee, that presently lives with them. And the Lord has not blessed him with any grandchildren. You can't have any of mine. I don't have enough to go around. <laughs> so, uh, David has plenty, though. Check with him. <laughs> <laughs> He's uh, living in the sand, Big Sandy, Texas. And everyone knows where Big Sandy is. That's right up the stream from Little Sandy. <laughs> But one thing I really like about Doug, you know, last night I picked up Johnny Oxendine and Ken Chumley at the airport, and their, both their flights were late, and they arrived both about, I picked them up both about 11 o'clock last night, because the distance to the home, we didn't get, get back to the uh, house until about a little bit after midnight, and of course, you know, things that happened, we didn't really get to bed about 11, uh, 1 1.30. So the thing I like most about them, Mallory, is that I did not have to pick him up at the airport. <laughs> <laughs> he drove himself and took care of himself. I didn't have to arrange housing for you. He had, had all that arranged. I really like this guy. <laughs> But the subject that he's speaking about, of course, is one of great importance to us. Uh, it, as I said, it has had, has had an insidious influence on the churches today. And so I think that the subject is very timely, and I know that will be a very uh, worthwhile and interesting subject. That's so conspicuous. Say, I'm from at least in the present time in central East Texas in the Piney Woods. And folks take their time to do anything. But you know, down here you get run over. <laughs> I'm telling you, traffic is mighty fast. And, uh, and especially when you're not sure just where you're supposed to turn here or there, and they, they get impatient with you, blow their horns at you, and things like that. Well, anyway, uh, I appreciate so much Brother Brown and the elders and the congregation here giving me this opportunity to participate in this lectureship. I'm looking forward to getting better acquainted with some of you that I've uh, come in contact with on the internet. 
in other ways, some of the gospel preachers that I, some of them I've uh, met for the first time today, but I know a lot about you uh, otherwise. You know, when Brother Brown gave me this subject concerning colleges, I thought, why didn't he give me something like on instrumental music where I could really go to town on that, about that innovation and things like that, or uh, some other subject that was there. After all, it's been a while since Doug McClays and LeBon and I attended Fred Hardman in the mid-50s. And so I, I've lost, you know, back there, whenever a college hour at a private school was 12 and a half, $12.50, and I think at uh, public schools it was three, four dollars Now it's probably around 300 or so. So there's a lot of change. Uh, brethren like uh, Brother Brown, Brother Jerry C. Brewer, and Brother Philip Smith, who's now preaching in Tallahassee, Oklahoma, have all provided me some material for the lesson now, so we will hurriedly get into it. Uh, brethren have noble aspirations in establishing schools of formal education. And uh, they have seen where many young people from members of the church have gone to state and university colleges and their faith has been destroyed. So this, this is something that would seem to be desirable. Brother Baxel Barrett Baxter, in a 1952 lectureship at Harding College, commended these schools. And certainly, during that period of time when the Brotherhood at large was more faithful than many are today, and where many of the schools were more dependable in upholding a thus saith the Lord, those schools were an asset to the church. And they can still be. But in many ways they're detrimental. Now what happened? Well, still there in the 1950s, there were many of these colleges that were seeking higher academic accreditation. But there is where the problem crept in. But someone says, well, what's wrong with that? At that time, we didn't have any universities among brethren. Now we have several colleges and universities. But today, many of them are not proclaiming the word of God in its truth as they once were. In the May 2007 issue of Seek the Old Pass, Brother Chris Dawson, a gospel preacher from Chelsea, Michigan, attended the Rochester College, formerly Michigan Christian College, for the first time. They had their second diversity dialogue, and that ought to have raised a red flag. But they had several speakers there, even had two women as keynote speakers. One of the ladies was a, name by the name, a lady by the name of Carol Van Hooser. She is a member of the Apostolic Church, but she is also a, an assistant professor in the biology department at Rochester. And she teaches evolution in that college, which reminds me that Abilene Christian College or University has been guilty of that in the past at least, if not now. But uh, someone called her hand about teaching evolution in the school. 
she says, what's the big deal? Whether the young people believe that the Lord created the physical universe in six days or over a long period of time. Brother Otis Gatewood, as the old proverb would say, would turn over his, in his grave if he knew how that college has changed. Brethren and large failed to heed Brother R. Rice's warnings of digression radiating from Brotherhood schools. He had been out of the United States in mission work in Malaysia, Hong Kong, the Republic of China, and Russia. He was shocked when he saw how much digression was in many areas of the Brotherhood. And so he wrote a book, Acts at the Root, and sound brethren such as Diane Woods, B.C. Good Pasture, Gus Nichols, endorse that book as well as many others. And in that book, he gave warning of what would come and has come. But he gave them suggestions about how to keep from these things coming. And a sleeping brotherhood wouldn't listen. We might say today, hindsight, is better than foresight. And not only him, but Brother Foy Wallace, Jr. spoke out about some things. For example, Abilene Christian was trying to get into the pocketbook of the church, into the treasury of the church, and he spoke out against this. But this good brother, Brother Ira Rice, wrote, uh, began two other books, Acts at the Root, and he began in 1969, as probably all of you know, Contending for the Faith publication, and continued as his publisher and editor until the year 2000. Now Brother David Brown is the publisher and editor of that paper, and both men have contributed heavily to the welfare of the congregate, uh, to the church in warning brethren against error, but many don't appreciate it. Nevertheless, we need to be warned. If brethren had only heeded Brother Rice's admonition, when he was still president of Four Seas College, 1966 to 68, he spoke out against these errors. And especially in the volume two of Acts on the Root, he brought out some things, and let me quote him. Young would-be preachers, teachers, and college professors themselves not well grounded in the truth, going off to such divinity schools as Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Chicago, Southern California, and the like, in living deeply of secular and sectarian theologies, philosophies, and psychologies, then coming back into our pulpits and classrooms and corrupting our whole teaching process with their newfound doctrines and commandments of men contrary to the word of God. We see many with little or no experience as full-time preachers are the professors in college, relatively young men with Ph.D. degrees, trying to tell the young men going through those schools how to be preachers when they have never served as a full-time preacher. When Brother Rice wrote the second volume of Acts on the Root, there are nine suggestions that I wish to bring out one, he suggested that college administrators quit encouraging young men 
who are not grounded in the faith to go for those higher degrees until they have had some experience and are more grounded in the faith. Secondly, the colleges among us who have been infiltrated with false teachers should let them go. Well, in that book, he mentioned some of the colleges that had fired some of those liberal teachers. But those same ones that they fired would probably be embraced in those colleges today. Thirdly, we're told that the church depends heavily upon our colleges for the training of leadership. Well, they depend just as much heavily upon the church for support and the providing of young people. Brother Rice further states in volume two of Acts at the Root, if the choice has to be between truth and accreditation, brethren, I leave it to you. Which should it be? Perhaps we should give some attention to the suggestion made by Brother Lloyd L. Smith, who preaches at Sunset Dallas, Texas, that our colleges go ahead and accredit their secular departments, leaving their Bible department unaccredited, if this is possible. If we can't have the truth and accreditation too, can we afford to give up the truth? What does it profit if we gain the whole world of accreditation and lose our soundness in our souls? That's what he said. Number four, in addition to going to the doctrinal soundness of present faculties, he emphasized to the administration should determine what philosophy of instruction they provided. Number five, concerning supposed gospel papers and literature put out by brethren. If it was not sound, then we don't have to subscribe to those papers. And I remember when Brother Doug McClish uh, was there at Denton uh, with Pearl Street, and they had one of the lectureships, there was a table where they had all of the, uh, in the area near where they had all of the books, people for sale and things of that nature. And he was, had presented the different books that were being published as from the brethren and many, basically, if I understand right, they were just changing the outside cover and using denominational material. That ought not to be. We need to be careful about the type of literature that we use in our local congregations whether it's sound in the faith, and especially for our young people. Elders in the process of securing preachers should make sure that they are sound in the faith. A church near where I'm at, when I first moved, I've been there over four years in East Texas. A congregation close by, soon after I got there, fired their youth director, and they ought to have. He was teaching the young people they didn't have to be baptized for the remission of sins. He had recently come forth from one of our brotherhood colleges. That ought not to be. Elders, when they find there is a false proclaimer, they ought to warn other congregations about it. Eighthly, in an effort to restore offending uh, teachers or preachers who are teaching false doctrine, they ought to be approached in a loving way. For example, Galatians 6, verses 1 and 2, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, restore such one in the spirit of meekness, consider thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Ninthly, those that continue to teach false doctrine 
apply such passages as Romans 16, 17, and 18, mark them, withdraw from them. When we were still at Drumright, Oklahoma, our congregation was one of the congregations that withdrew from Quail Spring Congregation in the Oklahoma City area because of their fellowship with Baptist Church there in their area. Many of you are aware that they have recently introduced instrumental music in their worship. My understanding, the Memorial Church there at Oklahoma Christian would not go along with the brethren that spoke out against this. And so there's a great danger there at Oklahoma Christian concerning the young people that they may learn from those people that instrumental is all right when in reality it's contrary to the scriptures. Brother Rice, as we pointed out, has attempted to warn brethren, but brethren would not listen. And now we have many that are drifting off. But let me point out about summerism. Summerism was wrong. But many of our brotherhood schools have drifted from their moors. Now, when Bethany College was established by Brother Alexander Campbell, he provided money and was the first land and was the first president of that school in the fall of 1840, the first school among brethren here in the United States. A young man by the name of Daniel Sommer, S-O-M-M-E-R, attended that school for a little while. Why he dropped out, whether he was not college material, I don't know. But he turned against those colleges. And when he did that, uh, he started a movement that they thought that that was an institution that was doing something it should. But let's look at it this way. The Great Commission, we're to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Not only that, but the Apostle Paul, as we learn in Acts 19, verses 9 and 10, he taught daily in a school of Tyrannus for two years. Anytime we have an opportunity to teach God's Word, we ought to. In the latter part of 1956, I was in St. Louis, Missouri. And I didn't know Carl Petricide from any other preacher. I looked in the yellow pages and happened to uh, come across his name as a Church of Christ preacher, and I called him, and he told me uh, where to attend a service. And, of course, even as a relatively new convert, it didn't take me long to realize there was something wrong. He held the position at that time, and he located preacher. He didn't believe that a local congregation could hold have the services of a full-time preacher. He also was against the colleges. That was like summerism. But he told me that he was going over into Ireland the next year, which was 1957. Well, he must have already been troubled about his doctrine and teaching. Maybe he was not satisfied that he was not getting the response. Uh, Brother G.K. Wallace had debated him twice and defeated him. But when he was over there, he made a statement, and I've gone on a website about Carl Petricide, and supposedly he found Christ for the first time whenever he had been preaching for years. And he made about face and began to promote liberalism promote fellowship with the instrumental people and uh, he was developing into universal fellowship of any who profess Christ. Philosophers of early college founders, one thing, they didn't use the word Christian in the name of the college. Another thing, they did not look upon 
the colleges as being a preacher factory. They was looking up on it as having a rounded uh, education for those that attended with Christian principles involved. Not only was Bethany College established by Alexander Campbell, but Albert and Charlotte Fanning established the Franklin College in 1845, about five miles east on their farm from Nashville. And then later, David Lipscomb and James A. Harding established the Nashville Bible School in the 18, early 1890s that later became David Lipscomb College. Well, what is the relationship of the college and the church? There's none. You hear, you get on their websites, you go to Abilene, you go to Pepperdine, you go to Oklahoma Christian, and this one they talk about being affiliated, uh, associated with, and so forth. The college is neither the church, a work of the church, a part of the church, nor an adjunct of the church. It's not an auxiliary of the church. The college is first and last and always an auxiliary of the home. Church schools is not good terminology from a biblical standpoint. The scriptures teach us that it's in the home that children are to be taught. Solomon said, train up the child in the way he should go. The Apostle Paul said, bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. It's the solemn responsibility of the home to, to provide secular education, not the church. The state recognizes the home as having the right of free alternatives. Homeschooling, private schools, or public schools. That is the prerogative of the home. And therefore, we cannot allow the colleges to get into the pocketbook of the church. If individuals want to support them, that's their business. But you know, many of these colleges are preoccupied in raising money, and they raise it by from large corporations and other ways that they no longer are interested in adhering to faithful brethren. They don't have to answer to them from a financial standpoint. They can get their money elsewhere. And therefore, there is a major problem. What are some of the major reasons why this departure from the faith through colleges and universities among brethren is taking place. We've already mentioned one. Number one, in seeking higher accreditation. These schools have continued to hire PhDs or their equivalent of men and women who are not grounded in the faith. Number two, by seeking federal funding these private colleges and universities submit to greater government regulations. Not only that, but organizations like the ACLU can have an opportunity to go in and try to uh, offset the church, or rather the college, and, and dictate under the college what they think ought to be done there in the college. Other reasons for these negative influences include, like many elderships that have men that are not qualified to be elders, many of these colleges, the first prerogative in selecting a man to be a trustee is how much money he can provide for, for the college. It's not how faithful he is. 
the history of these schools show that some of these trustees, like they've had out in Pepperdine, are not even members of the church. The administration of some of these schools are preoccupied with raising money over concerns for a strict adherence to a thus saith the Lord. Many of the professors in Bible departments have been painted with the philosophies of men and teach this in those classes. Several of these same professors have little or no experience as gospel preachers. And yet, many of the young men that come forth from those schools, uh, the first prerogative that brethren want to know, do you have a degree? That's great. If, they, if they're sound in the faith. We've had a lot of good sound men that have had doctor's degrees. But there's a lot now that are not. Just what is and has been the effect of the Brotherhood Colleges upon the church? There's a mixture. Some have promoted unity and then division. A history of upholding the truth and then in digression from God's truth. Many of these schools are now leading brethren into fellowship with those who brought division with their innovations of instrumental music and the missionary society. In time, this could develop into a complete apostasy. If so, faithful brethren in the future will be able to look back to this period of time and see that the colleges among brethren took the lead in this apostasy. If these schools established by faithful brethren are destined to be taken over by digressive liberals with modernistic views, then is it worth our energies, our effort to produce these schools? and then have them taken over by those who do not love the truth. Those schools can be a great asset, but many are not. Concerning this matter, we find that some brethren have looked upon these schools as the answer. The church is the answer to upholding the truth. 1 Timothy 3.15, it is a pillar and ground of truth. The church is to provide the means of producing preachers. And I'm looking forward to the internet uh, preacher program that uh, Brother David uh, Brown and the congregation here have started. We need some sound schools. And so we're looking forward to those. For many years, brethren have uh, looked at these colleges. They charge for their workshops. And then many churches are charging for their workshops. It's one thing to produce material and uh, some brethren to produce this and, and to provide it at lectureships as we're doing here. But it's another thing when Take an example of colleges to charge admission to come. I know that workshops and providing preachers uh, for lectureships and things like that, it's a big expense. And the church here is to be commended for having such lectureships as this. But nevertheless, uh, we need brethren to realize that uh, the church is not in the commercial business. And uh, will the time come when some congregation will charge alien sinners to come in to learn what they must do to be saved? We trust and pray that that time will not come. 
Now, I haven't attended a lectureship among those colleges, such as Oklahoma Christian. I guess that was the last one I attended when I was preaching at Cushing, Oklahoma, back in the 70s. It's been over 30 years since I've attended one. I'm not enthused of going to those lectureships. When I see, especially in more recent times, they use digressive men from the instrumental groups to speak on those lectureships, to promote fellowship among them. That's not right. That's not right. And brethren ought to realize this and speak out against it. Well, I know that uh, I could have some other thoughts here. Brother Cohn, this is uh, pretty well my lesson at this time. Uh, I just wanted to uh, give some thoughts concerning uh, the colleges. I'm not of the summarism. I'm not against having these colleges. But if we do have them, let's have faithful brethren to make sure that they remain faithful. That those on the, uh, who are trustees are grounded in the faith. That the administration are faithful men. That all the teachers are grounded in the faith. And if we do that, then they can be a great asset. We know that uh, uh, many places where we've had those colleges, you'll see in the near area that there are, are more congregations established. There have been more of these uh, influence of these colleges. But now, whenever they began to reverse and to promote liberal philosophies, doctrines and creeds of men, then we must stand up against it. And if necessary, with some of these colleges, if we can't reach them, we must turn away from them. Thank you.